David Warburton, MP, is sipping an alcohol-free beer while thinking back on less sober periods and the damaging photo that ultimately brought him down. It was widely reported in the media a year ago, and in it, Mr. Warburton is shown sitting at a kitchen table with lines of cocaine on an upside-down baking pan, resting his chin on the back of his hand like Rodden's thinker. Some people thought that this nearly artistically created scenario at the time appeared too accusatory to be real. There were even allegations that a foreign communist power may have been involved in the photo's distribution. Due to an inquiry being conducted by Parliament's independent complaints and grievance scheme ISCs into claims that he made in welcome attempts to two women, Mr. Warburton, 57, has not been allowed to explain himself until now. His 53-year-old wife, Harriet, a diplomat's daughter, is listening to our conversation as he sits in front of me in a London hotel. Her face can be seen on the screen of her husband's smartphone, which is lying on a table. Did he use cocaine that evening? One can see the no teetotal MP flinching and maybe simply admitting that he was inebriated but that no white powder entered his nose. Instead, he tells the truth. He responds, to be fair, I mean, I'm not gonna lie, by the end of the night, yeah. We had been consuming copious amounts of really powerful Japanese whiskey until it became quite late. The confession lingers in the air for a moment. It was a setup, Mrs. Warburton adds abruptly. It's a honey trap. Her trembling voice struggles to escape the phone. It is simple to see her in person as being more abrasive. Her allegiance is intense and outspoken, far from the stereotype of a wrong but submissive politician's wife, and she will interfere in a similar way multiple times over the following two hours. She says, it's extremely odd because there is a bright light source at the top left of the photo. It was almost like a picture studio. Really strange her spouse admits that the shot was taken by an English woman who spoke fluent Russian and whom he had only seen twice previously. This furthers the suspense. He is unable to comment on whether what was unquestionably a sting had a political component. As MPs, we were constantly cautioned about Russian espionage, but I never took it seriously. But I was definitely duped, he claims. For starters, he was unaware of the photograph at the time. He says, it was around four in the morning and I thought she was just playing on her phone, texting someone. She must have snapped my photo at that time, I thought. Given the nature of the situation the MP was in, his wife's support may come as a surprise. One of the many accusations he was subjected to concerned a parliamentary staffer, whose bottom he is supposed to have squeezed at the British Kebab Awards during what she described as a consensual hug. It came after a heated argument between the assistant and one of his ex-girlfriends, which the MP attempted to defuse. Mrs. Warburton argues that her husband's action who denies bottom grabbing were largely motivated by financial worries and that the aide was envious of someone else in his social group. She recalls her spouse, she was crazy about you. She felt envious of any woman who approached David. I didn't think so at the time, but I guess I see it now, he responds. Mr. Warburton, who entered Parliament in 2015 and secured the country's largest swing to the Tories, tells this newspaper he is resigning his Summerton and Froome seat in Somerset in the coming days, not out of penitence though he admits he has been naive and incredibly stupid, but rather because, he claims, the parliamentary authorities failed him. He alleges that he was handled horribly and that he wasn't given a fair hearing. I won't be a part of a facility that tolerates this madness. The legislature needs to reform, but it won't be doing that with me. I'm advancing. He claims that middle-aged male politicians simply have no chance in the post meadow environment, even if the accusations against them are patently baseless and driven by retaliation. And yet, despite everything, he appears to be truly upset. However, despite his accusations of a Kafkaesque witch hunt, Many would believe that this was first and foremost a dishonest matter, and that he deliberately contributed to his own demise. It's more of a midlife meltdown than a midlife crisis. Given that he has openly advocated for international action in tackling the drugs trade, the admission of cocaine may draw criticism for hypocrisy. He has no defense other than being inebriated.
He does, however, vehemently contest the Russian speaker's account of what transpired at her one-bedroom home in southwest London that evening, February 1, last year. She declined to file a complaint or provide her services as a witness, thus none of her allegations were included in the ISKS's investigation. However, both her version of events and that of the aide and a third lady were published in the Sunday Times. In contrast, Mr. Warburton claims that despite his intense desire to speak up, he adhered to the ISKS's guidelines regarding confidentiality and kept quiet throughout the course of the investigation. The MP, who is gregarious and laid back, admits it was a mistake to have been friends with his accusers, although maintaining that his motives were always honorable. He claims the two ladies routinely discussed their sex lives in the WhatsApp group where he was in addition to the assistant and the Russian speaker. The Russian speaker in one discussion states, I'm going out tomorrow with a 45-year-old. That's not terrible, says the assistant. Speaker in Russian, no, he must be older for me. Just a thought I have strong kinks for elderly males. Find them to be really tasty. Dad, let's take off those red pants. I assume they were just having fun and being stupid, sort of absurd, trying to embarrass me because I'm an old man, Mr. Warburton remembers. He claims that never did he support them or act in the same way. The Russian speaker then asked Mr. Warburton to her house on February 1 after texting him while he was in the comments for a late vote. She said it would be a good chance to talk about their common buddy, the assistant, who he claims had been giving him issues at work. The Russian-speaking person left him a voicemail saying, I wouldn't put anything past her at this point. She texted him an intimate photo of her cleavage wearing a damp t-shirt in an apparent effort to speed his arrival because she thought he was chickening out. Mr. Warburton believes that this did not influence him. He admits it was insane to go meet a very flirtatious lady more than 25 years younger than him while he was worse for wear but he insists he was just looking for her opinion on their troublesome acquaintance. He disputes her accusations that he grabbed her in her bed and urged her to order cocaine. His wife supports him once more. He was concerned about what she the aide might do because she was volatile. The MP and the Russian speaker had a conversation about their life and their common buddy when he first arrived. She reportedly felt increasingly uncomfortable while they were alone together and the Russian speaker claims she went to her bedroom to change into her pajamas to make it plain that she wanted him to leave. But Mr. Warburton asserts, that's simply not true. I can still hear her precise words. You may remain if you want, but we're not doing anything, she said. I said, of course not, saying no, no, no. She adds that the next morning he asked her whether she was proud that an MP had been at her house. Mr. Warburton is furious and responds, there is no way that I am the kind of guy who would say something like that. I'm not the type of guy who thinks being an MP is awesome. He claims they parted ways amicably and texted each other later that day to discuss potential future meetings. Mr. Warburton is not your typical conservative. He was born in reading and was dismissed from grammar school for smoking behind the cricket pavilion. He claims that this was the final straw after a string of little infractions. After relocating, he attended a comprehensive school before enrolling at the Royal College of Music. He later worked as a teacher, played in rock bands, and earned money from a company that sold mobile phone downloads of music before making another career transition that brought him into real estate. He participated in litter-picking campaigns in his district and served as an organist at his neighborhood parish church. He didn't know about the cocaine photo until it made headlines in April of last year. Senior Tory party figures expressed alarm in the Mail on Sunday article at the time that he could have been the target of an adversarial foreign power. The assistant and another lady who worked in Parliament also made accusations in addition to the Russian speaker's account of what transpired that evening. He recalls, I was reeling from it. I was completely taken aback by what they were saying. I was unable to walk normally. Mr. Warburton wound himself in the hospital on suicide watch while experiencing shock and stress. None of the women had ever even remotely challenged him or shown the slightest hint that anything wasn't right. However, 
They are now alleging that he started acting improperly in both Parliament and at late-night gatherings in and around Westminster, which he vigorously refutes. He sincerely believes that a disagreement with the aid which he is unable to detail for legal reasons was what ultimately led to the allegations. He claims that it took the ISCs 85 days to certify that it was even looking into him, leaving him in the dark. Before its detectives got in touch with him, five months had passed. And afterwards, he claims, they made no effort to contact all of his witnesses. The aide said he placed his hand on Herney at the common stranger's bar, then later that night in his Westminster apartment, while kissing her forehead, he did it once again. He claims that this is inaccurate and that the only thing he did was to comfort her when she grew upset when discussing her personal issues. He explains, it would have been odd not to. He gave the ISCs 4,500 text exchanges he had with the assistant. He claims they prove his innocence, demonstrating, among other things, that she sent him several nice messages and offered to fetch my groceries and water my plants when he was resting in his apartment after fracturing two ribs in the days following the unwanted advances. In his office, Mr. Warburton was alleged to have freely discussed sex as a topic and nicknamed a lady babe. I did not discuss sex in the office, but I did call her babe, he responds. I used to ask, do you want another drink, babe, back then, which was probably a little foolish. He claims that after the Parliamentary Commissioner for Standards, Daniel Greenberg, eventually disregarded the text messages and all of his documented proof, the ISCs had decided in the aide's favor. He stated the texts were useless as there is no usual manner for a victim to behave, Mr. Warburton says. According to him, the parliamentary commissioner acknowledged the aide's violation of the probe's secrecy regulations but said he didn't think it affected the investigation. They intended for me to have no defense and be unable to refute their assertions, he continues. They blocked all of my options, my rights have been entirely removed by them. They are afraid of the Meadow movement and they can't have me returning to the location parliament and just roaming about because of all the press attention. The last thing they want is a headline that reads, MP let off. They want to seem to be cleaning up parliament. According to him, the third woman's accusations were completely refuted. She stated that as she tried to leave his house, he touched her and forbade her from doing so. However, Mr. Warburton continues, she gave them the ISCs a video of herself saying she was in danger and talking darkly about powerful men, allegedly taken in my bathroom. I was able to disprove that it was my restroom, though. She was wearing different clothing in the video, despite the fact that I have images of what she was wearing that evening at a public function. Mr. Warburton was hospitalized for a total of six weeks during which time he had suicidal thoughts. Thoughts of his family his wife and kids were compelled to flee brought him back from the edge. The majority of the witnesses, according to him, work for me and may be trying to protect their jobs, therefore Mr. Greenberg decided against considering my witnesses. Mr. Warburton continues, he says my character and behavior, as described by the women, was enough to prove I did it. He believed that I deserved a harsher punishment because I didn't express regret. Since I didn't commit the crime, I didn't express regret. They dismantled every line of defense David had, his wife continues. We seem to be in North Korea. I believe David acted foolishly and was plainly ignorant. However, our financial situation at the time was really stressful for him, but my main impression is that the celebration left us utterly high and dry. From my perspective, no one phoned me when this all started and I had to hide with my kids in someone else's home with the curtains shut. I had no assistance. I eventually made contact with the spouse of another MP who had gone through a comparable experience. She only instructed me to don my pearls and beam. The advice was limited to that. Everything has been a nightmare, someone said.